exchange. The other one is use. use. So what is exchange value? What is use value? Come on, come on, come on. Exchange value is vis-a-vis -vis other goods, other commodities. Use value is, I mean, the practical usage of it. Other goods. You guys can see, right? Yeah. It's uh, practical use. All right. What's next? What's the question that Marx asked? The value. The exchange value. Since there are two goods that, because the value of exchange value is basically the value compared to other goods, goods X and goods Y, how do you determine the value in a way? Please. So what did he say? Labor. In what sense? The average effort expended in producing one. Right? So she yes, necessary labor. Okay, that's already a bit of a problem. Before that, okay, that's a good thing. But what how many how many types of labor we're talking about here? Abstract. Right. Right. That's abstract. Concrete. Concrete, alright. What's the difference? I'm gonna point people now. Um uh Amit? <laughs> What's abstract labor? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yo. Abstract labor. What's that? Oh, right. Homogenized, right? Simplest. Oh, is that how you spell it? Yes. Yeah. What is concrete labor? The actual labor that you're doing the work. Yeah. I think this is. Somebody have to type this one. <laughs> yes, okay. What do you get? You get what you mean. Yeah. Let me help you. Okay, you guys, it's now it's easy for me to talk. Uh, um, there's a two types of labor. There's a lead, there's a kind of. There's a, I have the actual labor. Why do you need to have this particular thing? Why do you need to have abstract labor? Why are you supposed to you can just talk about concrete labors? Concrete labors is basically the labors that actually involve in doing works. So why don't we just measure the time of the labors in no, the, the real time labors in a way? Why not? Why? Because this, because we have this problem, because if you are if you're looking at a different industry, there are certain things that you that requires doctors, for instance, this. They, uh, they might actually work the same hours as uh, teachers, but the, the, the kind of labor that they, the value that they need is different, isn't it? They have more intensity, more skills, more complicated machines, more complicated uh, uh, procedures and everything. So that's why we have to imagine another thing, the abstract labor, where this abstract labor is basically the simplest labor that becomes the standard, standard to measure any complex labor that comes up after that. So Marx is okay. It's, uh, it's, there's a, it's I'm making a risk here, but nonetheless, abstract labor is this. Then. It's the simplest labor where you don't you don't need any skills to do. It's basically kind of a things that you can do spontaneously. Again, it's effort. hard to measure. Yeah. Basic it's, effort. Yeah, it's a basic biological things that you can do as, as a general general basic human beings. Okay, that's the standard. So what what are the uh, so these are basically the standard that Marx. That is to say that what are the difference between uh, between phones, the value of phones, and the value of, for example, books, is the amount of labor expended in the production process between the, these two particular goods, and those labor that we are talking about here, not uh, concretely, but talking about abstract labor, then we can have a more common denominators. So just imagine two goods, good A being produced by abstract labor, which is two hours abstract labor, the other one is. But again, it's, there's another thing that Marx had detailed on, socially necessary labor time. That the very definition, the very value of this abstract labor, for example, if you want work two hours, it's valued this way, work three hours, it's gonna, two hours of work of abstract labor, gonna cost, right? So, sorry, it's Maybe we shouldn't go so micro, because we just have to cover like three. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. But again, these are the things that you have to understand in a way. Yeah. So, okay, that's abstract labor. What about, uh, uh, what about, what, what is labor theory of value then? So, labor, the, the value of any goods, any commodities, any commodities in fact, yes, commodities, uh, that you find in the markets are based on the 
amount of labor is expended on the production process. That is how much labor being included, being used in producing that very good itself. Okay, so that's the labor theory of value in a way. Okay, what else? How does this particular amount involved to become exploitation of labor? No? Exploitation of labor. How do you recall what happened? Yes, okay. One thing about labor is this, that once labor, uh, there's a kind of, first there's, a, there's, a, there's an MCM relation, by the way. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a C, uh, M, C, and there's MCM relations. So now, now you have a labor and you know the value of their goods. So what do you do in a, in a market is that you have your own goods, you want to trade it into money, because then you can find other goods. What is money in the end? Money is this object thing that enables you to transfer your labor, labor to get another, uh, uh, your, your labor in a way, to sell your labor in a way, to get the other goods of the same amount. So you have a goods which cost hours of labor, you want to trade it, you want to get another goods which also cost the same thing. So that's why you have this CMC. You have a commodity, the goods that you produce, then you trade it with money, that money somehow carries the value of your labor, and you can buy another good at equal amount of the things that you buy, that you sell before this. That's basically, but the problem lies when you have these MCM relationships. What is this, MCM relationships? Anybody know about this, no? So this is where the exploitation comes in. First, you have to acknowledge the irony of it. What is that? At first, we have commodity, then we switch, we trade with money, then we, that money we trade it with another goods, right? It seems perfectly fine. But what happens if you have money as a commodity? That is, you have money, then you trade it with goods, and you, 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 you involve in certain process, you buy capital, then from that capital, you, you get another extra money. This is M, M0, and this is M1. At the end of this process, you get M1, M0 is greater, Less, less than M1. So this, this is where the irony comes in. Because again, if all trade and exchange value are basically equal, where does the, the surplus right. the surplus money come from? In a way, that's where Marx has to investigate what happened here. And, and he finds out that this kind of relationships is basically only applies when there's a two things. We have a capital. And capitalists. Why? Because capital, capitalists, as a capitalist, you do this. You have money, you buy capital, isn't it? Mm. So for you to be able to make more money out of that, you hire workers to produce another goods to sell, which call which give you profits. Is it not? Yeah. So this particular process where you have you are capitalist, you own capital, and there's a labor involved, that's where the exploitation comes in because Another thing that Marx observes is this, that labor is the one that creates the value. Because supposedly, if the whole process is fair, there's no profits in the end. There can't be any profits. But what happened is that during the, this, this particular kind of relationship, the labor, the wages that the capitalists pay, is not enough or doesn't suffice with the amount of value that the labor created. So this kind of a surplus gap, the value created, say 20 values, just put it in a mathematical terms now. The labor created goods which cost 20 values or 20 that cost 20 hours of work like, you know, 20, 20, 20 ringgit, like, just put it that way. What happened is that the capitalist paid 10 ringgit here, he export another 10 ringgit. There's a profit, he determined there's a profit. Why he can claim profits? Because they, they have this basic um, property right kind of relationships where I own the capital, you work for me, that is to say everything that you produce is mine. I sell it, but I pay you for your works. But what Marx acknowledges here is that the kind of payments that they give doesn't equal the amount of value that the labor created in the particular political process. That's why Marx termed it as a kind of a exploitation. Even though it's kind of a wages where okay, everyone consensusly agreed to it. Yeah, I agree to the wages, you agree to pay, I agree to, uh, to do the works for you. Mm. But on the logics of the equivalence of uh, value, that is the kind of, lab, the kind of values that you put, and the one that you get is not equal there. Your labor worth something, the kind of labor that you created out of the production process worth something, 
But of course, the wages doesn't somehow reflect that. It can only be reflected at the end of the product, where you see how much profits and how much wages, then you can actually somehow figure out what the, where, where, where does the surplus value come from. In the way that. So that's where this position comes in. Anyway. So that's part of it. Uh, we discussed about that quite, quite at length in our last month's section. But then the second thing that Marx can identify is also about prices. What about prices that you can recall about? Crisis? Or, no? What is it? Marxian crisis. There's a lot of crisis, there's overproduction. But the one that we covered like this. Overproduction is under consumption. Overproduction under consumption, yes. That's that's true. But I think the word we've learned yeah, the most important part is this, the falling rate of profits. All oh, right. Okay, yeah, correct. The, rate, the, the falling rate of profits. What does it really mean again? Overproduction. Sorry? Under because I guess, I mean, intuitively, uh, you produce to sell, right? But if you're looking to make more profit, that means uh, you have to suppress wages. So the labor force, which makes up the bulk of the population, have less spending power when you suppress their wages. Hence, they can't buy more from you. Profit falls in the long run. But okay. First, we have to, to understand what is what he what he meant by crisis. It's not to say that more people are going to die. Uh, no, it's basically a crisis where you know it's not working as it is. I mean, this particular system is going to collapse because of this crisis. These are the kind of a negative aspects that are going to make sure that the, makes the whole system destabilize. What is the, he said? I mean, this is again you can debate about it. Marxists, a lot of Marxists have already rejected this. Some Marxists still actually appreciate this, but one of the things that Marx uh, mentioned is that there's a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. In what sense? Just imagine this. There's three particular main rules that you have to understand to, to, to get these particular concepts. First, uh, is a competitive markets where capitalists have to constantly grow. Competitive markets. They have to make sure that they, they somehow have more growth in terms of their productions. They need to produce more and more and more and more and more. So what then did they do? They have to produce more, and they have to do two things. Either they hire more workers, or they hire more workers, or they make their technology more efficient by introducing more capital to it. So most of the times, if you hire more, then you're going to cost more, isn't it? Yeah. So what did they do is this. Because again, if you hire more, cost more, the price is going to go up. Everyone else actually doesn't do that. Your, your company is going to be you know, out of the market. Again. So what are the best thing that capitalists do is try to make sure that they have more cheaper cost of productions by investing more capital. There is more machines. So what happened? Okay, that's the first principle. The second principle is that um, once you invest more machines, less workers, I need it. then you have more unemployment. There's more unemployment. There's always this imbalance between teasing for growth and also to balance out the organic composition between capital and the workers. That is, you see, you try to make sure that you try to cheapen your costs, but at the same time, you need markets too. You need demands too. You know it. So this kind of a conflict. This is the first appearances that you can that you can see very obviously between the interests of two classes: the capitalists and also the workers. Capitalists have this particular interest. Labors have this particular interest. In the end, they are competing with each other, and also they can't actually serve their own interests both, uh, both at the same time. Yeah. In a way, somebody have to win, somebody have to lose. But again, if capitalists win, see, they're gonna hire less worker. In the long run, their profits gonna fall too because no one's gonna buy their products. Yeah. So it's kind of an unavoidable, unavoidable problem, if you like. That they, so, but of course, I mean, you don't see that today in a way. Some would argue you don't see that today because Mark also outlined the accounting differences. These are forces. Again, we're not talking about the real point here. We're not talking about the exact number where how many, how many profits fall, blah, blah, blah. But according to this particular logic, there's a tendency for the profits, the rate of profits to fall. But also, there's always a counter tendency. Uh, there could be a, you know, um, the price of corns decrease. That is to say, the cost of living decrease. People, even though there's less people working, but they can still pay 
to buy the goods and everything. We might be a, uh, at, at the creation of a new industry. There's more industry being introduced. So once you have more industry, people get there's more job creation there. But I mean, Marx would argue that uh, in the long run, you can't sustain this. Because creation of industries might be able to somehow support at the moment. But there are always restricted resources. Uh, there's this limited kind of uh, scar resources, natural resources, that you can't actually create industry everywhere. Now we look at the reality today. Uh, where, again, I mentioned to you I think in the last four, four classes, I think, that we talk about now how economy is not evolving into a more uh, virtual kind of economic exchange. It's not just you're buying not a man, you, without, without using money anymore. That's why. Secondly, you are buying stuff that don't exist. There's no, tan no tangible things that you can touch anymore. You're buying apps. You're buying uh, PDF. You're buying basically e-books. That's. You're buying that. That's, yeah. Yeah, so all these things are somehow virtual. And also no longer uh, produce, mass produce. This. <coughs> Think about apps. Huh? How many people needed to produce apps? Think about Facebook um, company. You think they're gonna hire like what? Thousand people? Two thousand people? No. If you Google Facebook companies, you see they're not as many as those who are produce, you know, producing uh, cloth and um, trousers and pants. But also now the, the interesting development is this. Now you have a 3D invention. You have these machines that can be able to produce anything from your home. So now everyone can produce themselves. Less, even less workers can actually require to produce that because you just need to focus on one particular industry, that is to produce a machine that be able to produce anything. Then other than that, you just need to make sure that there's apps here and there to produce the, the thing itself. So if you have a 3D machine, you just need to buy a certain apps or certain ideas, install it in the machine, and you can produce, I don't know, cakes, goods, whatever it is. It's getting more and more people, being less and more, more machines oriented economy. That's what they call it. They tell me it's more like a creative economy. In a sense, that are depending on your creativity now. But what one what, what of the other sides of it is that if everyone's are thinking, uh, no one's are producing, no one's are involved in, in the man to man kind of production process, uh, one would argue that not everyone can do the thinking. There's always somehow been somebody, especially look at the education today as well, that somebody's are being left out, and they have no job now, and they become the, according to Marx, the reserve army of labor. Yeah. That's the word of the Because they are the ones that are going to cause riots, demonstrations, and maybe revolutions. So that's, um, uh, the other thing is, uh, okay, that's one, one of the crises that Marx talked about. But also one of the critics of Marx is this. Uh, let's look at that now in a very general sense, of course. You have okay. nine minutes to 10.30, man. It's really? Uh, yeah, you, you can do it. Okay, I'm going to skip the session. Hold on. Uh, okay, that's basically the overall ideas of Marx, if you like. That you have this Marx talking about the theory of value, <laughs> talking about exploitation, also talking about the crisis. But again, the things that you get, the whole impression that you get from this is that Marx is not talking about a specific faction of economy. They're looking at the economy as a whole, a totality. Again, the very word that I use, that I think is missing in the framework that we use to look at the economy today. Rabbi Ricardo. Anything about Rabbi Ricardo? Pretty much the same thing. Because again, it's a pure libertarian value. There's no limit. It's, it's not a new it's word, pure was used by, by the economists. But the word pure libertarian value is this. That again, the same thing with Marx. The, the price of the good itself is basically depending on the labor production, but the labor is part of the production process. <coughs> yeah. That's, then we kind of skip a lot of things uh, for Ricardo, but we talk about rent issue. Do we talk about rent? We don't. One thing that's also a thing important about Ricardo is this is a kind of, there's a theory of permanent uh, changes of. Rate of, uh, rate of profits. Uh, we miss that, okay, we skip that part, where you can actually look at the slides. But the general idea is that the, the rate of profits doesn't fall according to Ricardo. It can change, but it's dependent on um, the nature of 
how many, how much labor I spend on the production process, how much it's required to produce, to produce a particular good. To produce, I think, the basic good, sorry. I have to check the energy. But that is to say, if, you are impro uh, if the standard of living is uh, improving or decreasing, that can affect the rate of profits. So it's kind of a linear process where it actually affects your, your, uh, your standard of living to the workers, only then the rate of profit will change in the long run. So if the rate of profit, uh, if the standard livings are uh, getting higher, then the rate of profit is going to fall. Right? So it's kind of a like inverse relationship. So that's, uh, Ricardo, we haven't covered much, but I think the slides uh, should be good enough. Uh, then it's Adam Smith. Okay, anything about Adam Smith that you remember, Nicole? Okay, what is the name that Adam Smith used? So what exactly is the system is all about? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. People are mostly free. Do you get that mostly free? No, it's not. I I add that up. But because it's really not all free, mostly free. People are mostly free to pray. So people are mostly free to do their economic exchanges um, without directly help others because they own their own neighbors, they own their own goods, capital, uh, capital and they own their own things. What are the things about Adam Smith that you've learned other things? The, how about the ethical parts of it? Anybody can explain about that? Do you mean the good life? Sorry? Uh, the idea of a good life, ease of mind, peace of So the, the systems should address this. Yeah that it must create uh, a piece of body and the ease of mind, in a sense to the... Ease of body and peace of mind. Okay, sorry. Why did it by the way? Uh, the ease of... Ease of... Ease, ease of, of body, peace of mind. The ease of body and the peace of mind. Yeah. That's the one that I'm looking for. <laughs> so the ease of body and the peace of mind. That is to say that you have not only uh, necessary basic things to survive, uh, for the major part of the society, uh, but also the, the kind of a mental part where you do live a good life in a way. So, of course, a, the, the economic system doesn't actually promote you to, to do goods directly. It doesn't say you, can, you have to do goods. But one thing that it says is that, um, uh, that the, major, the, physic, the major part of the societies can only, if, if you improve the major part of the societies, which is the workers, that only you'll be able to somehow uplift the whole happiness. Of the, mid, of the whole society, in a way. So how, why do you think that the system actually had be able to help them, to help the poor? Why, by the way? I believe the capitalists would give them more wages over time. Not really. No, not really. The system would force them to do it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. First, okay, uh, there's, a lot, there's a price mechanism, how the price of wages is blah, blah, blah. There's an average wages, average income, uh, average... Uh, uh, rent, kind of a rent, and also the rate of profits. Constant uh, co-rate of profits, if you like. So there's a rate of profits, profits. There's an average, of average, yeah? everything is average. Wages, and also rent. These three things make up the price. In a way. The price, not the value, the price. Also, okay, the whole economy, economy is basically working constant growing of, of, of more output and more output. He introduced two, two, capi two pieces of capital. And everybody know about that? Two pieces of capital, anybody? Two what? Two pieces of capital. No, 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 no. Tell us, man. Time's almost up. Tell us. Just give, give us. Just give everything to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the two things of capital is this. I mean, he's actually somehow on the same page as Marx. Mm. Because he thinks that the rate of profits in the long run are going to fall. Mm. But he doesn't think that's going to act as a crisis. Because according to him, at least, that even the rate of profits going to fall, mm. uh, you're not going to approach zero. 
obviously the rate, the percentage is going to go down, but it's still the percentage actually makes up higher revenues and higher profits. Mm. It's just the percentage is going to go down. Yeah, great. Capital is still actually be able to function. So why is the rate of profit going to fall? I mean, according to the Adam Smith theory, that um, it's it's a two, there's a two two factor. One factor is that once capitalists produce more, produce more, what's going to happen? Increase more supply. Increase yep. more supply, what's going to happen? Price goes up. Uh, price goes go down. Goes up. When price goes down, in a way, the profits going to fall. Yep. Okay, but also, the other factor is this. And you need to produce more. What's going to happen? What, what do you need to produce more? Labor. More labor. More labor. Uh, more labor. So when you need more labor, you need higher costs. Higher cost means... Higher wages. Uh, not really. Uh, higher cost means... Lower profit. Higher... Uh, low profits. Either you can increase the price, but again, you will get the same profits, but if no one else do it, it's not going to be productive for you. It's better for you to somehow get the lower profits because everyone does it. It's very competitive in the end. So you have to lower down your profits. Because there's more workers that you have to hire. So in the long run, uh, these particular things can actually cause capitalists to get low, low rate of profits. But what about the workers? Why do you think that the workers are going to benefit more? More people are employed. Production. Sorry? More people are employed. Yeah. More okay. First, um, the, the formula is this. The rate of growth of supply of labor, and the, the rate of growth of demand for labor, is greater than the, the, growth, the rate of growth of the supply of labor. Okay. okay. Uh, According that to is to say, Sorry? According to Smith at the time. According to Smith. It's not true. You can't really check this. Yep. But according to Smith, that, okay, when you have more uh, economy where it's, it's going to produce more output, more output, more outputs, and the higher more laborers, right? Mm. So when, uh, so you, you have a greater demand for laborers. Mm. When you have more demand for laborers, what's going to happen? You're going to hire. Wages going to go up. Uh, up. Because there's more demand now. So once the demand, the wages are going to go up, but also there's a counter reaction where when the wages go up, they're going to reproduce more. There's going to be more population of laborers. So the supply of laborers is going to go up now. Then the wages are going to go down back. But the thing is, I mean, he said the, the, the wages are going to constantly grow up because the, no, the amount of demand, the rate of growth of demand is higher than the rate of growth of the supply. Okay. In a way that it see, it's uh, we need more workers, 10 people, but the growth, the growth of the, labor, the, the growth of the supply of laborers is going to have only five. So, so we still keep, uh, the, the economy is still wanting more and more and more demand to be able. So that particular forces will allow the, the basic price to always constantly go up in the long run. That's not true. Ricardo rejected this, you know what I mean? Uh, because he is following my office in that sense. Okay, that's the other thing. What are the things about, um, I don't know about it. Sorry? Specializing, okay, specializations. Division of labor. Division of labor. What about division of labor? Uh, it's to greater prosperity for all. It's uh, for greater prosperity for all. Okay, anything else? I think it's a really curious now. Can I say something? Yeah. Different? All these are there, but I just want to give another narrative. Yeah, go. Shoot. I mean, uh, up until Smith, you know, like uh, economic activity, trade and all, was seen in functional terms. We know it because society you have to do it, yeah. you need to exceed. But what Smith brought about was, uh, he grounded it in sentiments. We have this propensity to talk about an exchange. So it's inherent in all human beings. He grounds it in human nature. And so from that, he derives division of labor as something natural. Mm. That is how markets and everything come about. Yes. So, but then another line of thought that he brought about was that this, all this, leads us to being civilized. Makes us be more civilized? Yes. yes. Uh, it creates civil societies and all that. And this is in some ways what Marx is speaking of when he says um, it's creating a middle class bourgeois society and with its ethics of alienation, which Marx was against. I guess maybe that's not mentioned. Here. Yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. So uh, the kind of division of labor somehow, it's actually good for efficient efficiency in the sense that it's be able to so produce more and more. But it also high, highlights more obvious kind of a division of classes. It creates a kind of a classes where you are basically working as this, so this is where you are in the economic strata of society. You are neighbors, you are, you are, you are neighbors, and then you also become, there's a kind of a hierarchy of neighbors in fact, depending yeah. on what you do in the division of neighbors. But the whole process is actually useful enough to be able to produce more and more efficient process of 
production process. But that is where, this is where alienation comes from. Well, Mark criticized about it by saying that uh, this is kind of alienation and workers are somehow, it's making, it's getting more and more dumb. This is not something new to Marx. I mean, if Marx framed it in a more philosophical way, but Smith also acknowledged this. He said that, yeah, workers are getting more, more and more dumb. Definitely, that's true. That's why, <coughs> this is where the most, most EP comes, comes in, that the government should intervene in a way to provide education for the workers. So they'd be able to somehow get out their poverty uh, trap, if you like. Because again, they, they, they are not taught, that's where they are in the sort of society, they can't go out because they're depending on the kind of arrangement of the economic process at the time. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to get out of it, uh, not to get out of what, I don't think you use the word get out of it, but to be able to get more, to get easy life, or at least peaceful yep. life, is to know that, to get more education in that sense. Uh, Partly you can go out, true, that's true, but also uh, based on the system itself, it, there must be someone at the at the bottom. At the bottom. Yeah. You can't have everyone at the top. The very system of the very system itself requires for someone to be at the bottom and in a way oppressed. Also, okay, one of the things is Adam Smith theory as well is that the the, the rule of value. He was on one of the first somehow, not one of not the first, but one of the first that points out that the goods itself. It's divided into two things, action value uh, and, and uh, useful value. And action value somehow depending on labor, labor, the, the amount of labor expanded the production process. But what differs him between, what differs him and Marx is this, that he think that the good itself, and the value of the good itself is universal. That is to say that, for example, uh, the value of 10 hours of labor is always going to be the same. Regardless of what time you are, what age you are, or what centuries you are. Because it has an ontological meaning that somehow embedded in the good itself. While Marx was introducing a more kind of a social base where he said, yeah, there's a kind of a labor's interaction where the labor's, the amount of labor's are, have a certain values, but those values are depending on the social relations at the time. It could change, you know. So that's pretty much the kind of things that we covered uh, most of the time. Actually, you know, one of the great things, but again, I'll give you one of the things that I think is more beneficial because again, I was approaching the end of the classes. We just take another few more minutes. But when I was actually um, uh, got instructed, not instructed, I mean, got, I was told to, 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 to do the classes. One of the things that somehow the organizer makes sure that I, I do is that not to make the classes too, either too compact because I don't know why. why. Uh, he said it's most of you are trying to learn from these things. Also, not to make sure that you guys are somehow stressed because it's at the end of the day, uh, you guys are so stressed out. So that's why we have this format where we cannot talk about it for a while, for one hour, then we have this documentary to show you what is actually happening in the real world. And what, what I would uh, like for you to get out of this class, not really the particulars, that is to say what Marx says, and because those are the things that you can read in the slides. The reason why I came here to really create the kind of curiosity, the kind of questions, and try to show you that there are problems, regardless of whether you acknowledge it or not. There are problems. And of course, there are many ways to look at it. Some would say, yeah, let's look at the specifics. That is, talking about whether the government should intervene or not. That's it. The government should be more fear, uh, or the country should be more fear, or the government should be more interventionist. But one thing I would propose when, uh, then I think that you should guys should learn from this. It's not to really look at this particular issue, small issues. What's needed is this, that you have to somehow rethink everything about economics. The very way you look at economics functions, the very way you somehow conceptualize economics, that's where somehow you have to stop for a while, pause for a moment, and revisit back. Because classical economics talk, talk about something quite different, despite them talking about uh, the same thing, the same object, but in a very different way. He mentioned, he talked about labels. He talked about morality. <coughs> These are the things that somehow been you know, always missing in the economic today. Not just missing, it's, the, it's, doesn't, it's not that in the very definition of how you look at economics. It's always about efficiencies in the end. Uh, and of course, I'm trying to introduce you these three, three particular figures in a way. Like it or not, the influence, like it or not, uh, Marx, Ricardo, and others, is the foundation that somehow later on will be modified uh, radically to something else. 
But the foundations are there, and we are the one issue. Uh, this is going to sound a bit traditionalist, but sometimes when you are in the midst of chaos, it's time to go back and look at the, what the classical have to see. Because they are, those are the simpler times. And the simple ideas sometimes uh, more, have more clarity of what exactly is happening. Because once you have to get into this complicated stuff, uh, you miss the whole bigger picture in many ways. And those young, back in those days, they have no problems yet in that particular sense. So they can be able to see the bigger pictures in a more clear manner. So that's the takeaway of this. Uh, in OK, I'm just going to take another five minutes uh, to, to, to talk, uh, no, not, to, not for me to talk, but for you to talk, in a way, because I promise the organizer to, to say this. Uh, I'm going to replace the questions uh, by Lenin. What is to be done? Is that, is that the word? In a way, what's next? What's next? Okay, do you have any ideas or suggestions or feedbacks? In a way, that how do how you like to carry this, this kind of questions and <coughs> problems of economy that you've learned so far to a more wider discussion? Are you thinking about reading groups? What are things that this is definitely reading? It doesn't have to do it, of course, mm -hmm. but something that you can somehow throw in the public or throw in the discussion that maybe the organizer can take up and do it. I would say, uh, do, I, I said to Amin just now that, yeah, it's a good thing that you do a lot of things, but I think what's needed to do is, uh, is writing this. To create a proper reading groups that really, really study the materials intensely, intensely. Mm -hmm. can be able to write and produce writings. Because in the end, in the next 10 or 20 years, those are the writings that become an archive for you to look at how these particular ideas spreads up and how does it affect everyone else. I really, really hope that, um, okay, what are the ideas? Anybody want to suggest anything? Reading groups? More classes? More classes? No? Uh, no more classes, I think. I'm done with classes. I'm going to go back.